Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us on the weekly chat for the Survive PhD MOOC. Now we had organised a quite a spectacular uh, live broadcast event here. We had snacks and pizza and then we realised that everyone thought we were advertising the online broadcast and didn't realise we were expecting people to actually turn up and be with us. But we have, do have two people with us, two students tonight. So that's Hilary and Kim. So thanks Hilary and Kim for coming. And thank you for the team. Tonight I've got with me, sitting around the table, Katie, um, Crystal, Margaret and Anna. And they may or may not join me on broadcasting later, Anna and Katie, right? Hopefully. All right, so welcome. We hope you enjoyed this week and the topic was loneliness. And uh, we're now officially more than halfway through the MOOC and we certainly found that loneliness resonated with many people. Um, uh, so... Before we get on to the topic of loneliness and talk about some of the, the discussion in the forum this week, uh, we'd like to remind you there's still time to send in your videos. Uh, we sent a special email to you last week requesting videos, just talking about what you've learned, where you're from. We've got some really lovely ones um, and Katie's processing them through our, our email address. But she's going to tweet out one that we got that someone made public. So you can see the sort of thing that we were after, which was great. So thank you for sending that through. I think that was Mickey, am I right? It was Mickey. Thank you. Mickey in Wellington. Awesome. Thank you, Mickey in Wellington. I'll be in Wellington next week, actually, on Wednesday, if you're at the University of Wellington, I'll be giving some presentations. Okay, uh, there's still time to send in videos, so we'd love to see them. And there's still time to fill in our midway survey, am I right, Crystal? You Crystal's are. nodding. Um, so you can send in your feedback and let us know what we're doing well and what we're doing not so well. I think we're pretty aware of what we're not doing not so well, but it's always good to be told. Okay, now before we start badges, and we all know that badges sound lame until you get one and then they're awesome. Okay, um, there's been great interaction online. Um, special mentions to Drew64 and Zeba Denise, and thank you for congratulating us and saying that loneliness is now a thing of the past. Flattery will get you everywhere. We always love it. And we love the love hearts that come through. Thank you for the love hearts on Periscope. Um, in the forums, we'd like to thank in particular Amy Johnson CQU and Sarah Jane Gregory. And both of these people did really great work supporting others, commenting and providing really great advice. Thank you. Nadia Dav, also for her piece on 20% writing and 80% rewriting is a really worthy insight. And the, the reminder that nothing is perfect in the first draft is always welcome. And we've got Lost Poet JJ providing um, helpful details of a book for those people who are really shy. And it hit the note with Marg Prescott, one of our moderators, who thought that was quite fabulous. On Twitter, we have Sof Sofa F, that's Sophia Friends. Um, and we're giving you a badge, Sophia, for setting up a Melbourne meetup, which hopefully was more successful than our Canberra one this evening. So thank you for doing that. And... Um, and to Mary Sp Spaniel uh, for the baking. So um, thanks for sending all those fantastic pictures. Now we've got three things we want to talk about tonight. And these are based on our interactions in the forum. Uh, we're going to talk about spaces for PhD work, socialising for introverts, and ideas for fostering community. We've been tossing around a few. We have a whiteboard full of ideas that we'll talk about later. And at the end, we'll talk about some services that are available inside ANU, but we believe many other universities have similar services that you can look up. Okay. Um, uh, so for those of you who feel like they need more support in person, we want to direct you to where you can find those sources of support. But this broadcast is about constructive strategies. Now, in one post in the forum, and I believe the same student filled in our feedback survey, they pointed out that we didn't provide actually many strategies for overcoming loneliness and they criticised the course material for not telling, I think, telling them what to do. And we were very deliberate about that because we don't think there's one size fits all solution for or any or all of these problems that we're raising. In fact, what we wanted to do in the course was create the opportunity for us to talk about these issues and to leverage the wisdom of the crowds. And so tonight we are going to talk about the concrete strategies because you've told us so many interesting and amazing things. And I know this is inevitably frustrating, but this is the approach that we're taking. I know some people do like to be told exactly what to do, and I'm afraid um, I never quite do that because I don't think it's realistic. Um, so uh, we're going to broadcast, uh, as usual, on our Twitter chat on the Survive PhD hashtag, which is just that thing there. Um, 
all the links that I talk about in, in the broadcast tonight. And we're also going to make it into a Storify, so later on you can look it up. I know it goes past very fast on Twitter and, and check out the links later. Okay, so getting on first of all to the spaces in PhD work. Jabasco said, he or she, we're not quite sure of the gender and that's a good thing. Um, I'm going to call her she, just, just for, for fun. She was surprised by the exercise that we put for you today, this week, which was basically to get out there and socialise. Um, and she says, <clears throat> in my research group, we all go to the canteen together for lunch every day at noon, traditional Dutch lunchtime, as do most of the other research groups at my faculty that I know of. While not everyone joins every day, we always have a big bunch of PhD students, postdocs, and the old fac odd faculty member as well. I didn't realise that this made us the exception rather than the rule. And later on, DePasco said, <clears throat> everyone is roughly on an equal footing. PhD students are usually seen as inexperienced researchers rather than as students. And if that makes sense, and it makes perfect sense, DePasco. This also means that faculty members are not in your supervisory team can still easily form part of your support network by providing informal mentoring and advice. I hope this doesn't come across as rubbing in how good I've got it. Hopefully this can provide some inspiration for the things that we can do to improve the social atmosphere at your research group. And I think most people's responses to this post, including mine, were summed up by um, CG7, who said, I wish this was the rule at my campus. It's actually quite an ideal setup and one that's recommended by most of the research on, on research student experience. I note in that statement, De Pasco, how important the canteen was as a space for socialising. And in my view, actually, a lot of the problems in the PhD space could be solved by more kitchens. And I've written a paper about this, um, which I linked to in one of the earlier modules, which was about troubling talk and talked about the role of kitchens as space that enables us to have these kinds of conversations. So perhaps it was the delightful Dutch lunch tradition that helped cement this culture, perhaps. But Pan Joseph made an interesting point when she said, I share an office that has 10 students sharing seven desks. Of those, only three of us are here most days, and one of those usually comes in for just a few hours in the late afternoon or evening. Of the others, two are international students who are overseas collecting data, one is on leave, one lives out of the metro area but comes in part-time, and three seem to work almost exclusively from home or somewhere. We did make a concerted effort to meet for lunch one day, and almost everyone who wasn't overseas came along. It was fun. I think there was a shared interest in doing it again, but it would rely on one of us to take the lead and to get everyone else organised. Does this sound familiar? I know that I was part of many attempts to make socialising happen, and it does sometimes rely on someone taking the lead and making those organisational moves. And look, we're all busy. But some of my research I've been doing on employability suggests it's exactly those kind of things, people stepping up and taking those leadership positions that make difference um, when you're going to look for a job later. I notice, notice in my eye line, Kim is nodding furiously and Kim is on the executive of PASA at ANU. And so if you do want to get involved in helping organise social events, PASA is the place to start doing that, obviously. So without the mutually agreed importance of lunch, and I think we can all agree that lunch is extremely important, does everything just become harder? Or are there actually more pervasive issues at work here? Alison3629 said something interesting. It is interesting to hear about the different experiences, De Pasco. I'm from Australia, but have now spent time in a few European countries, and I wonder if the difference is partly about the status of PhD students. I'm not sure about the Netherlands, but I know in Switzerland and Denmark, PhD students are also pop at employees, earning a wage with office space and responsibilities to the department. I think this makes a big difference in how integrated they are. If you're paying someone, then you pay attention to what they're doing, and I think there's something really in that. Um, and I think one of the really interesting things about running this MOOC, and something that we've enjoyed and talked about in our moderation team a lot, is comparing the experiences across and around the world and seeing how good practice might be replicated one place to another, but also to think of the reasons why it might not be. Now, I've written a fair bit on the blog about how to, to help social interactions. 
um, help them move along. And I'll write some more because clearly it's an area of interest both to me and to, to the readers and to people in the blog. But one that I've read, written that Katie's going to tweet out is um, Office or Cafe, which is a better workspace, where I started to think about some of my silly data collection on the refreshments will be provided hashtag. And I started to then, in that post, talk about the importance of cafe spaces on campus as alternative um, spaces to write, yes, but also just places to be. And this post was in, inspired by a New York Times article called Des uh, Destination Laptopistan, um, which is amusing and well worth a read, and Katie's going to tweet out the link to that as well. Now, if you are super nerdily interested in the effect of space on learning, and I know I am, and um, I know I have fellow nerds amongst you out there, so if you're interested in about space, learning, socialising and academia, you could look no further than Jan Nespor's authoritative tome, Knowledge in Motion. He explores in that book how the actual spaces of a physics school and of a business school's structure how knowledge is made, shared, and delivered. And um, Katie's going to send a nerd up. Thank you, Shefton. Nerd up, everyone. Katie's going to send that link. Um, it's a rather expensive book, unfortunately, as so many academic books are. Uh, finally, we heard from a lot of distant students in the forum. Now, Lynn's 010888 said, I live in Port Hedland, Western Australia. Google it. It's pretty amazing. I haven't been there, but it looks it looks incredible. I do my PhD through Curtin in Perth, which is actually a very long way from Port Hedland. It is certainly lonely, and I only started a PhD because I was moving here, so I have very little friends and no colleagues. I run my business by myself, but I still love it. Yes, it's lonely, and I must be particularly driven and disciplined, but it will be worth it in the end. Any other distance ed students out there, she asks. Now, uh, we had quite a few people reply to this thread, which is worth having a look at, but I want to thank Fiona White, for, particularly for describing my blog and Pat Thompson's blog, and Pat might be listening tonight, I saw she was on Twitter, hello Pat, um, as her two thesis best friends, I felt the glow of love, thank you for that, I feel honoured. Um, Margaret Valentin said, um, in response to, to the question about distance ed students, the university provides online tutorials about the usual study information and how to do this or that. Information that sounds quite easy to achieve, but in the practical world, it is not so easy to implement. How true is that? What I'm finding comforting about these tutorials, though, is that real people talk, and my soul cries out, thank God for people. And I agree, you know, these static online courses, they seem to be quite the rule in the sector. You know, do something for our online students, and so you make a course full of links, and, and it's kind of dead because there's no one talking there. Um, is, um, is the standard response sometimes when, it's, it's when that order is given down from management. And we've tried very not to, much not to do that in this course. We want to, as I said, focus on fostering interaction. Um, even if, and I understand, those discussion forums in edX are very terrible to use and they're very difficult to navigate and we're trying our best and we're giving them feedback, don't you worry. Okay, now of course there's other ways of creating face-to-face -face interactions online. And thank you again to Fiona White, who started the PhD OWLS, which sounds, stands for Older, Wiser Learners. And I've given the link, which Katie's going to tweet out. That's to a page. You have to, from the page, then join the group. Uh, I joined today, and they very kindly let me in, though I don't think I'm old enough or wise enough. I'm hoping I'm not, anyway. Um, so Fiona may add you. And, um, and that looks like they're having a great time in there and it's a really popular group. How many people are in the group now? So 155, there may be more. Yeah, so that's a really great effort. Um, and it's good to see people creating those kind of groups. And again, let us know if you've started a group like that because we like to publicise it through the channel so that uh, it gets more people joining in. Now, if you want help or advice on starting peer-to-peer -peer groups like this, there's a couple of good books I can recommend. Doctorates Down Under has a whole section called Engaging Your Support Systems. And Katie's going to link, um, put a link to that book now in Twitter. Katie, you were putting... Yes, she's giving me the thumbs up. Yes, she has put the link. Um, I've recommended a couple of times now. And I know it says Down Under, and i actually not really a big fan of the Down Under thing. Maybe we're up top and upside down. I don't know. But anyway, there's three books in the series and they're all great, so worth the read. You don't have to be down under for it to actually be useful. Now, also a big shout out 
to my New Zealand colleague, Susan, Dr. Susan Carter at the University of Auckland. Long ago now, she put together a comprehensive book called Developing Generic Support for Doctoral Students' Practice and Pedagogy. I contributed some material to this, but it's not structured in chapters, so I couldn't tell you it's page number X or X. Um, but there's a lot of people um, who do what I do who are contributing to that book. And um, it's really valuable, I think, addition to the canon. However, the price point, I think it's $45 for a Kindle. A bit too much for most people, I would say. So um, approach your library and see if they can get hold of a copy, maybe electronically. It's worth having a look through. Okay, so our next topic was socialising for introverts. Now, many people felt or responded to our mild challenge to just get out there, have a cup of tea, talk to someone you've not talked to before or for a while. They found this to be quite difficult. And um, this post in our forum by Lost Poet JJ really touched on a few of these issues and had quite a few responses. So Lost Poet JJ says, in my faculty, there's a discussion group which PhD students are encouraged to attend. I tried going a few times and didn't enjoy it much. I felt that some people were dominating the discussion. I tried talking to the conveners, suggesting more active facilitation to allow everyone to participate, but they weren't interested. I'm well aware that the problem here is largely mine. In a face-to-face -face group situation where there's a free-for-all, i.e. no hand-raising or structure, I simply can't tell when it's appropriate to speak. Despite observing, I can't see how people do this, and it means I tend to either jump in inappropriately or end up feeling embarrassed or just stay quiet. Does anyone know anything I can read on this topic? I'm probably on the autism spectrum. Social skills, particularly face-to-face, -face, feel like a second language. I'm pretty fluent these days, but I still have a lot to learn. I don't know if anyone stu uh, studied the, the amount of autism spectrum people, if you want to identify that way, who do a PhD, but I, from my 10 years of experience, I'd say it's probably rather high. Um, and I think it's a really good description of, of social interaction being like a second language. There's a constant need to process and to do this processing that comes to most people naturally, to do that consciously is exhausting. And I have some friends and relatives who, who, are, um, who do sort of struggle with that and they tell me that this just finds um, that they get exhausted in company really quickly and they also avoid it. They avoid it particularly when they're feeling tired because they just don't have the energy. Now, Lost Poet JJ did recommend one book called The Jelly Effect, How to Make Your Communication Stick, which might be useful. Um, and other people did join into this thread and who they identified either as introverted or as natural loners. One anonymous student wrote, watching this week's video and reading several posts got me thinking, I, like Einstein, like being alone. I mostly work alone, I mostly study alone, I relish all the time I spend alone. Whether it be in my office, the garden, in meditation, soaring and spitting, splitting firewood at an infinitum. When people strike up conversations in the street, at the post office, the supermarket checkout, my favourite coffee shop, I'm genuine in my responses. Like a picture hanging in a fine gallery, hang on, I, I got a line mixed up, and I enjoy listening to other points of view. However, I think the art of conversation, like a picture hanging in a fine gallery, is sometimes overrated. I'm at my most happiest when I'm alone, with my own thoughts or in the thoughts of others expressed in the written word, word i.e. when reading. I'm a loner, but I do not feel lonely. I often feel the pressure of society to be, well, more social, but mostly I resist, and mostly I am left alone. I am curious, I am alone in this mook with these feelings, or are others in here feeling a similar way, or perhaps are members of the invisible community? So there are over 19 responses to that post, so I think it does show that, um, that you've struck a chord and that in fact there are a lot of people who would consider themselves loner and, and enjoy that lonely state. What other people see as lonely, they see as being in the company of, of writers. And I certainly um, find that too. I, I enjoy the company of books too, but I, I can't claim to not be an extrovert every time I say that I'm actually not an extrovert, people just laugh at me. But I didn't grow up this way, trust me, I was very introverted when I was younger. I'm now, you. you were? That's not She's, I don't believe you. No one believes me. <laughs> but it's true. Anyway, Kath said in response, I agree with you in finding myself more comfortable with written interaction than conversing in person. Although I still write many more emails, Facebook and Twitter posts than I ever actually commit to. So she writes them and then doesn't send them, which I, I've never had that issue but a lot of people tell me that's how they feel in Twitter that they they try and write something and then feel they just can't say it and they delete it. 
In many conversations, especially with people I'm not familiar with, I feel a degree of vulnerability that can be challenging to overcome. In writing, I feel I don't have to share so much of myself as I do in person, which entails eye contact, body language, etc. It's also easy to carefully curate my thoughts, and it's less likely that I convey something unintended. So that, that forces me to think of a big question. Is socialising really a cure for loneliness? Does it even need to be cured? Should we be forcing students to socialise? I don't know. So there's certainly a lot of forced socialising in academia. Um, think about conferences. Now, my friend and fellow blogger who runs the research whisperer, Chin Koo, often have this discussion. Now, Chin's worst nightmare is a conference dinner on a boat because she can't get away from anyone. And that's actually, I would love a conference dinner on a boat. Fantastic views and conversation. So we did in, end up actually writing a post about this together. Well, she wrote the post after we, I scribbled a few lines to her. So it's more Chin than me. And um, she called it, it's not you, it's me. And um, Katie's gonna tweet it out today. And she included in that post uh, another blog post from William Panica called Screening Out Introverts in which it talks about behaviours that are rewarded in academia, and it's well worth the read. Chin's also written a lovely post about her own experience of the introverted state as an academic called Once a Wall Flower, which is great, and, um, and Katie's gonna tweet that out now. And um, of course, one of the most interesting books on this, which I've read, is called Quiet, The Power of Introverts by Susan Cain, um, and it's a, a you know, it's a very popular book and quite interesting, um, worth a read. I've given Katie a link to the TED Talk. If you don't have time to read the book, you probably have 15 minutes to watch a TED Talk, and it's a good TED Talk too. Um, now, one of our moderators, Anna, was feeling moved to come and share her story. Is she still feeling moved? If you've met Anna before, lots of love hearts for Anna as she comes up and takes, takes the screen. There's so many love hearts here, Anna. Come, on. Come see the love heart. <laughs> hey everyone, nice to see you again. And thank you very, very much for all of your wonderful comments to me. It was very encouraging. So I'd really like to share this very special story with you. And it really was quite a big deal for me to be live on Periscope a couple of weeks ago talking about confidence. So the story is, when I was an undergraduate many, many years ago, I was faced with a presentation. And in that presentation, I prepared exceptionally well, but could I get any words to come out of my mouth? No. So I stood there absolutely frozen in front of 40, 40 other fellow students. And since that time, I have been in absolute fear of giving any kind of oral presentation, standing in front of the class, and certainly going live on on Periscope. effectively Periscope. Um, so your comments were really, really great for me to hear. Um, and all of that fear went on um, for quite a number of years. And it really does feel like um, somebody who's um, very frightened of spiders going into a big, huge cage of them. So um, yes, yeah, so I'd like to hear um, say thank you to Inga and her wonderful team for mentoring me through this personal journey, taking me from my greatest, one of my greatest weaknesses, to the beginning of a strength. And I really couldn't have done it without, of your, without all of your wonderful love hearts, I have to say. <laughs> um, so again, thank you very much. I, I probably won't be the kind of person to ever stand up and give a three minute th thesis or um, have the calibre to give a TED talk or anything like that. Um, but it's really great to be here with you. So I guess the moral of the story is, always have courage to face your fears head on, even if it's many, many years later. Thanks everyone. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and there's still love hearts streaming in for you, Anna. Thank you so much. And, um, and it, it leads us nicely on to talking about what next week's topic is, which is fear. We're going to talk about the fear of presenting in particular, so that will open tomorrow morning. So to our last topic for tonight, and we've got a couple of minutes to go, five, six minutes to go. Um, so at the end of the MOOC, your final assignment is going to be to design an intervention. And it should, the intervention should address a problem that's been raised on the MOOC, any one of the problems. Now, 
Um, tonight, maybe in the next section, you'll be hearing some ideas that you could possibly flesh out. So um, it'd be a good idea to listen in closely. And I'd like to invite Katie. Katie, now many of you are Katie fans. Um, <laughs> she, I know this, she has fans. Trust me, there's going to be selfies. See, I love famous. See, see the love. So Katie's going to Katie, Katie's going to take over this bit. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the love. I love all of you individually, and I would tap back if that would work, but I might accidentally hang up um, on the periscope, which would be awkward. <laughs> um, so uh, the activity that we had planned for the 20 people who are going to come uh, was for everyone to brainstorm how to keep this community going after the MOOC ends. Um, we'd really like to see the kind of great feedback that we've got and the great, um, the great experiences that everyone's had continue. Uh, once the course is over. And um, so if you, anyone out there has some ideas, um, please share them on Periscope or on Twitter now um, while we chat about this section, because we really want to make sure that the community we've developed, the support networks we've developed don't go anywhere. And PhD Owls is a great, um, is one of those kind of great spaces where everyone can share their experiences after the MOOC ends. Okay, so if you have ideas, share them now and we'll catch them. Um, but some of the ideas that we generated in the room, thanks to Hillary and Kim, <laughs> is extra love for the two people who came to join us in Canberra. So tap, tap, tap for the people in the room here with us. We love both of you so much we can't even talk about it. <laughs> um, otherwise, it would have just been us and a lot of pizzas. <laughs> um, so Aaliyah just invited people in Perth to Thesis Friday at the Five Bar. So everyone go to that, obviously. Um, but one of the uh, suggestions that Kim had from another MOOC that she did was to create a mailing list, an email list, um, where everyone can kind of continue to share resources, can chat, and, and um, can kind of keep in touch after the course is over. Um, one of the other suggestions, or I'm just looking at the whiteboard where we wrote them down, which is not visible easily to me, <laughs> um, was... Thank you, Margaret. The next one was to have a regular newsletter. So if we could send out something like once a month or once, that was Anna's uh, excellent suggestion um, where we could uh, kind of say like the, this week in PhD news, here's your newsletter. Um, so that's a great suggestion. I think that would be a great way to kind of send out some stuff. Um, and the third one is a Facebook group, which I think is probably the most popular one I can see on the Periscope. A lot of people are saying Facebook. Um, if you're interested in Facebook, show Facebook some love. I can see purple, which I know is my iPad, which I think Kim has. <laughs> um, newsletter, there's a lot of love for newsletter. A LinkedIn group actually might be a really good one. Um, now the other question I kind of have is, should the group be for everyone, all PhD students everywhere of all ages and, and levels, or should it be for disciplines? Should there be a women in science Facebook group? Should there be a men's support group for doing the humanities? Should there be, um, we've got PhD owls for older students. Um, should we have ones for people just getting started, the five things you wish you'd known getting started, uh, so you're starting your PhD support group, that sort of thing. Um, so again, if you want to create those spaces now while the course is still going, um, and we can kind of advertise them and get people to join in. Um, so a special one for distance PhD students, I think that's a great idea. So I hope my fellow moderators are writing all of these down because I can't keep track while I'm talking. <laughs> um, uh, I think, was it you, Inger, who suggested having an Are You OK PhD Day? Yeah, that was mine. And yes, yeah, there were some fans for that in the room. So um, Are You OK Day is a day to kind of check in on um, your friends and make sure that everyone's OK and that they're kind of... Um, that you make sure you reach out to people so that you can check in on their mental health occasionally. So perhaps are you okay PhD day that we can advertise um, to different universities would be a great idea. All right, Beck loves that. So if Beck loves it, that's what we'll do. Beck, you're right. We also had a uh, suggestion of an annual reunion. On the annual <laughs> reunion. <laughs> yes, an annual reunion would be a wonderful idea. Um, Hannah, you were well, You were invited tonight, Hannah, to come to our live chat. But Hannah's in Tasmania. Hannah's in Tasmania. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and the last one there, Margaret, could you please read for me? Uh, monthly drinks night. Monthly <laughs> drinks night. We like anything. Our team likes anything that has alcohol in it. I think we should go for a drink after this, by the way, because I'm going to need it. Um, 
But just to set it up at your university, get someone to, to email out to say, hey, Friday's last Friday of the month is monthly drinks for PhD students and just go to the bar. Um, I got to know my PhD supervisor a lot better by having monthly drinks at the university bar in Wollongong. <laughs> what if you're not a drinker though? If you're not a drinker, that's a great question. A lot of people aren't. They have lemonade. You can come and have the, uh, the, the potato wedges with sweet chili sauce. I've learned as an Australian thing. For the Team Canada out there, you're going to have a poutine, okay? Just have one for me, because I miss it. Um, poutine is a gravy cheese fries, in case anyone. Okay. No one here I'm cheered. I expected, whenever I say poutine in Canada, people are like, yes. <laughs> and here it was like, what does that mean? It's like echo of silence. Yeah, silence. You guys yeah. all are out. Um, so, uh, yes, any ways to keep the community going, to keep the support networks going, would be um, greatly appreciated. Um, <laughs> Amy's not Canadian, but loves poutine. Good, good. We can be friends. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to hand it back to Inger, and we will wrap it up with questions. Yeah, I think I've got a few more things to say. So you've got to get back there and get Sorry. tweeting, Katie girl. Thank you, Katie. I'm a Katie fan. Who's a Katie fan? More love hearts for Katie. Thank you. Thank you. There's lots here, Katie, I'm telling you. Okay. And they're not just Kim. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Finally, just before we wrap it up, um, don't struggle alone, I think, is the thing with loneliness. Um, you don't have to stay in that space if you don't want to, if it's not where you want to be. If it's where you want to be, then great. But if you want to break out of it, there are things to help. And at ANU, we have a number of support services, and we're going to tweet out some links to them today. But I know that other universities pretty much have similar services, so just look for them. They won't have the same names, but they'll be the same things. So we have a Dean of Students here. Her name is Paula Newitt, and she can talk to you confidentially about issues with your supervisor, with other students, with your program. It could just be a helpful conversation for you. She's very clever. She thinks of strategies, or she could help you broker solutions. So we're going to send out the link to the Dean of Students. Um, usually in other universities, this role is, is um, filled by the Dean of Graduate Students or the Head of the Graduate School or someone similar like that. But here we have a Dean of Students for all students. Now the ANU Counselling Service are very old hands at helping through people through issues like shyness. And we'll send out a link to them. And of course, I've talked about them too in, in relation to imposter syndrome and in relation to talking to your supervisor and, and learning how better ways and strategies for communicating and being assertive. Um, at ANU, for those of you who are employees, you can also, we have a counselling service for staff, which I think is very humane. We're going to link out to that too. So that's an employee assistance program. Now, if the problem you're having is academic, we have the Academic Skills and Learning Centre. And um, that, that was pretty much the same name at RMIT when I was there. So Skills and Learning Centre seems to be the de rigueur name for such a unit. And they're able to help one-on-one -on -one consultations with writing and so on. For those of you who are non-ANU students, which is probably most of you, um, or for those people who are distance and online, I can't recommend highly enough the Beyond Blue website. Again, you don't just have to be Australian for this to be relevant. It has really excellent resources and programs, and we're going to link out um, to Beyond Blue. And there is Lifeline. Now, a Lifeline, you can talk on the phone if you're having a crisis situation, or you can browse their online resources. We're going to send out the link to Lifeline as well. So next week, we're doing fear. And just while I send out the most, um, you know, high risk, high stakes emotion, of course, I'm going on leave. Um, <laughs> that wasn't deliberate. But I will be in New Zealand for those of you who are at the University of Wellington. You should have got some notification. I'm going to do two workshops, write that journal article in seven days and spring clean your writing. I'm going to be very busy next Wednesday. The rest of the time I'm going to be driving around New Zealand which is lovely and I love New Zealand and they always have very nice food. So the team will still be here though and I'll still be checking in because where there's a Wi-Fi, there's a way. Um, so next week, hopefully the broadcast will be held by Steph, um, of course with the able assistance of Katie. So I encourage you to join in and tune in next week and thank you for listening today. Do we have time for questions from Twitter, Katie? Always. If there's any questions from Twitter or from Periscope, please um, feel free to send them through. Just Wellington, not Christchurch. No one's ever asked me to Christchurch. This is my third time to Wellington though. Um, so <laughs> make of that what you will. I have been, to, I have, we have been to Otago and I have been to, um, to Unitech in New Zealand as well. 
I will have a great trip. Thank you. I love it, love it down there. Dunedin. Dunedin's beautiful, but not this time. No, afraid I didn't have time. Um, any questions from Twitter? Yes, um, Kat has me a question. Are you going to discuss fear of success in the fear section? Yeah. Um, I investigated this in an education psychology course back in the day. Yeah, I saw that tweet just before while I jumped on while you were talking, Katie. Um, not specifically. We're going to look at fear of failure mostly, um, but I will see if, if you tweet me through some links, I'll, I'll pop them up in the resources section. And that would be really uh, helpful. So, and of course, any time you see that you've got links that you think are relevant to any of the other sections, we've sort of been har harvesting them to update the course for next time. Next time won't be next year, though. No one can make me do a MOOC each year. <laughs> at you least two it, years. You're going to break some hearts. At, at least two years, yeah. Okay, so that would be great if you could send that through. Thank you. Any other questions from Twitter? Um, no. There's one here that's. Um, can we agree that there is a difference between being alone and loneliness? Yes, I think we can agree there's a difference between being alone and loneliness. I think loneliness is the is when you're just not actually enjoying that um, and when it's affecting your mental health and your state of mind. Um, or if it's something unusual for you. You know, if, you, if you've always liked your own company and then suddenly, um, then that's not so much of a change. But if you've never really been one to like your own company and you're becoming sort of withdrawn, I think that's... Um, any sort of major drastic personality change while doing a PhD worries me. Um, uh, but, but yes, of course, I think that there's an assumption always that we try and make people be social as some sort of antidote, and I'm really questioning that myself. I probably was making some of that assumption as well. Um, and that could just be an ext extrovert thing. No other questions? Uh, no. no. Unless there's some on Periscope? Unless there's some on Periscope. I haven't managed to catch them going through. Okay, well, thank you for joining us tonight. And as usual, we've gone a little bit over time, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. And the team will be with you next week and I'll be there um, remotely. So enjoy yourselves. Enjoy fear, if such a thing is possible. The challenge next week is just to do something new and to report back on, on how you felt confronting that. So I'm um, looking forward to some really great um, discussions next week. Thank you. And thank you for all the love. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>